video, you already know it. Well. <laughs> so anyways, what's your life skin? Um, I swear to God, every time I do my intro, I just lose English more and more time. Like, at this point, it's just going to be... <laughs> like, I don't know. But anyways, <laughs> a lot of you... <laughs> Oh my god. The Gang wanna be reacting to this man. The core of Shiro Emilia. Emilia. Yes. The core of Shiro Shiro Emilia. <laughs> oh god. I gotta stop. Fate stay night and oath under snow. So yeah, we about to go ahead and react to this man. You know I'm gonna keep the fake content coming for y'all. As long as y'all keep smashing that like button, gang. And just yeah, I mean I love reading you guys comments. Also comment down below. Um, you guys sh should I should I uh, do a video where I react to you guys like funny like fake comments and like just fake comments and stuff like I, mean, I was thinking about that because you guys really like write a lot. You know what I'm saying? Some of you guys and I really really do appreciate reading those comments because I mean it's just like you know it's just, it's just lit. You know what I'm saying? Niggas, niggas wrote a whole paragraph like. I gotta see it. Like, <laughs> now comment down below if that would be a good idea. I'll really do that for y'all. But anyways, let's go ahead and get into this video, man. Something the majority of the Fate fandom can agree upon is that the main protagonist of Fate Stay Night, Shiro Emiya, is a very well- It's a such you be It's a such you be You better like, better subscribe, hit that bell and drop a comment. Yeah, a lot of you niggas be in my comments, talking that mess, man, I know you hate My heart's just shaking up just like a comment, cause I give a run, nigga, ain't no baby, ain't no baby, ain't no baby. It's a such you be ex, don't be sad, be glad, all I know is get lit and react to shit. If the haters get mad, cause you know they always watch it, and my knee all in my pocket, like I'm so scared, let's watch it, yeah. But the head is getting mad. And the head is getting mad. Such a beloved character. It helps that we have not one, not two, but three different stories to draw from just within the original visual novel in order to establish the main principles of the character involved. What I would like to posit here is that Shiro Emiya is fundamentally the same kind of person in all three routes of Fate Stay Night, as well as one additional story, Fate Calide Liner, Oath Under Snow. This video will be an attempt to make my case. Now, quick disclaimer, I'm going to discuss spoilers at length for all three routes of Fate Stay Night, including the still-in-progress Heaven Steel movie trilogy. I think it should also go without saying that I will be discussing spoilers for Oath Under Snow, and to a certain extent, Fate Zero. I don't cap, this nigga is talking so fast, bro, like, it's making me out of breath. My heart is racing. I'm not gonna talk about Colored Liner on the whole. I don't really like the show, and my longest bits of exposure to it were the movie and manga versions of Oath Under Snow. That being said, let's dive in. If I had to put my finger on one trait that really defines Shiro Emiya, it's friction. The primary thing that all versions of the character, besides like the main Kalite one, have in common is that in some way their primary conflict stems from how they interact with the world contrasted against their ideals and ambitions. This friction between dreams and reality is, IMO, the most interesting thing about the character, and one of the best parts of the That's series on the whole. Crazy. A guideline that helped me when writing this video was setting up the four Shiros on a sort of alignment chart D&D style. What you see on screen is said chart. Basically, all I did here is swap lawful, chaotic, good, and evil on this chart with four concepts related to Shiro. Selfless, selfish, dreamer, and realist. Here Oh, this nigga with all he done with. Oh! Hey, W2 whoever told me to react to this, man. Hold up, this dude done with. I like people that create create good systems. I place Dean Shiro as a selfish dreamer, yeah. Unlimited Blade Work Shiro as a selfless dreamer, Heaven Steel Shiro as a selfless realist, and Oath Under Snow Shiro as a selfish realist. Now, I should specify, all four versions of Shiro are in some capacity and heroes, and even though I am using the term selfish to describe two of them, I don't mean that in the capacity that they refuse to help others. What I mean is that these characters prefer to help the people they're closest to above all else, rather than indiscriminately lending their aid to humanity as a whole. One way in which we can explain for these placements is with how each version's use of the Unlimited Blade Work spell is treated in their route. Let's go through them one by one, starting with Dean. Here, Unlimited Blade Works is used only once, during Archer's last stand against Heracles, and Shiro never learns to do anything besides some very simple projection of Caliburn and Avalon, and, if you count filler, Concho and Vakia. Because of this, Shiro is forced to rely very heavily on Saber in battle and for moral support, and in falling in love with her, finds a selfish goal that he wants to pursue. He's forced to eventually leave this love behind, letting Saber disappear here so she can destroy the Holy Grail, and after this, Shiro continues to pursue his original dream of becoming a hero for the entire world. Here, Unlimited Blade Works is treated like a fleeting, unrealized dream, one that Shiro is far from earning by the end and that he'll have- Wait, did he pretty much- Wait, what? 
have to discover bro, the natural way, like the archer he I saw in his like, war. Wait, hold on. Did bro just like? Did he just let his feet? Female just like. Hold up. I I gotta keep listening. The Unlimited Hold Blade Works route takes a different approach. In this story, Shiro is confronted head on with the re reality of what his dream will lead him Bruh. to, but this happens in such a way that by the time he's forced to truly face his own demons at the hand of Archer, he has no one specific person he wants to fight for above anything else. True, this fight is technically to free Rin, but the stakes <laughs> are ultimately far more personal than that. Shiro Dang, is quite literally confronted squirt. with the ideal version of himself that he's always dreamed of becoming. And because of this, he slowly unlocks exactly the kind of powers he needs to come into that eventual evolution. By the end of the series, he's gotten so skilled with his projection that when given a mana source greater than his own, he's even able to create the Unlimited Blade Works marble using nothing but his own knowledge of its construction. You could even argue his version here is more pure than Archer's, since the landscape is so much wow. less depressing than the one Archer produces. And before we move on to Heaven's Feel, I should point out that it's likely the entire reason Archer from UBW wanted to kill Shiro is because he was canonically from a very similar route to the Fate one. In turn, this would mean that that as a selfish dreamer, he was nonetheless forced into the role of a selfless one, causing enormous amounts of dysphoria between what he wanted to become and what he eventually did. This version of Shiro was forged into the role of someone who fights for the greater good and the things he loves, and the reality that he'd eventually have to pick one acted as a slow burn destroying his dreams over the course of countless battles as a guardian. It's only when going through Unlimited Blade Works Shiro's character arc vicariously that he's able to let go of this, and yeah! continue to serve his purpose as a Okay, I ain't gonna cap, bro. He is spitting a lot of info in it in just like like no cap I'm, I'm i'm really 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 into this trying to keep up with every single thing because he is going and there is so much information when it comes to fate like this is it's completely just just unfathomable like it's it's nuts god damn Counter Guardian without the previously mentioned dysphoria, since at the very least he was able to watch himself overcome that obstacle from the third person. I'm, I'm tired, anyway, as for heaven's feel, this version Why? of Shiro isn't really ever granted proper use of the reality marble, at least not this the way the previous one was. From the... In this round, Shiro gains oh, an extremely direct pathway to Comment down below who that dirty nigga is that just grew from bugs. <laughs> using it through Archer's arm, with the only condition being that he'll have to take his training very slowly so the arm won't overtake him. Shiro, what? being Shiro, doesn't listen to this and tries to use the arm in order to protect people around him multiple times over before he could ever do so safely. Between Nine Lies Blade Works, projecting the Jewel Sword, fighting Saber Altar, and his final battle with Kirei, Shiro quickly exhausts his body's tolerance of the arm to the point that it literally transforms him into a walking mass of swords. The thing is, though, despite having put himself in a situation he shouldn't have been able to survive, thanks to Ilya's sacrifice at the end, he's given a new body and, in a way, rewarded for his heroism. In this story, Shiro never manages to reach the ideal that his unlimited blade work self could, but despite all this, he does live a happy life. After all the fighting and pain is behind him, Shiro is able to reap the rewards of his choice to love Sakura. The thing is, Shiro may not have realized the full extent of being a hero, but he still undoubtedly played that role. While the story does use things like Sakura's backstory and Saber's transformation very well to illustrate the darker, far more personal ramifications and reveals associated with Shiro's decision to pick apart his own dream. <laughs> no, he did not just squeeze all that info in. Okay, that's crazy. Even I don't know what the fuck he just said. He said, <laughs> oh, fuck. This is such a good, like, informative-ass video, and I'm really keeping up. Okay, try to keep, try my best to keep up, because what the fuck? But what the fuck? God damn! And choosing only the pieces he. Like, hold on, I gotta rewind that, nigga. No, 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 no. You don't need to hear this shit. Like, pay attention. Like, listen. Story and saber transformation very well to illustrate the darker, far more personal ramifications and reveals associated with Shiro's decision to take apart his own dream. And choosing only the pieces he wants from it, Shiro is still able to satisfy his desire to save others while protecting his loved ones. In other words, the choice's consequences are not very widespread, and at the end of the day, are possible to overcome. Sakura's pain was going to exist whether or not Shiro ever found out about it, and Saber Altar showed up before Shiro got Archer's arm. Despite individual losses, the things lost in Heaven's Steel are not crippling, and by the end of it, the one part of his body Shiro truly lost is returned to him, and stronger at that. I don't quite know if Shiro keeps Archer's arm once he gets his new body, or if his new one retains similar powers while resembling his first, but regardless, that one physical consequence is made totally moot by the end. Heaven's Steel may go to some dark places, but the route itself has one of the happiest endings of any Fate series to date. Why is that? Well, I think it boils down to a commonality between the original three stories. 
Let's not mince words here. Shiro is a privileged kid. He is a victim of lifelong trauma, and he has lost a lot by the time we meet him in Fate Stay Night, but I mean, just look at everything he still has. Shiro has a beautiful house all to himself, a surrogate sister in Taiga, magical powers, plenty of money, practical life skills, a fit body, a job. I mean, I'm not saying he's got it made, but he's not going to be struggling in the short term. The desperation involved in Shiro's actions always has to be driven by his desires and ideals, because he is not hurting for his current circumstances. Like, nigga got Most magic fans powers. I talk to seem to like Shiro a lot, and if I had to put down- Nigga, you got riches. <laughs> in top shape and everything like look at this nigga running and jumping like this like look at you nigga. who does that like yeah and <laughs> bro was like 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 you gotta be grateful you got a lot of stuff for why i'd say it's because the very nature of stay night demanded he be a well-developed character because trying to drive him into something don't like don't the need to survive or get back home from anime. a foreign world would not have worked with shiro's backstory so the solution the vn takes is giving him a big personality this does, however, come with a drawback, because you can never truly explore the extent of a character's nature until you've seen them really get desperate. So, the question is, what happens when you change the groundwork of the story? What happens when you change the mythical call to adventure that gives you a chance to bond with your lifelong crush and romance an attractive blonde girl into a horrifying foreign ritual that claimed the life of the girl you love after someone directly involved kidnapped the only family you had left? Fuck! Well, you get Oath Under Snow. The Shiro of this story is fundamentally very different from his counterparts, even from the very beginning. He never knew the kind, tired old man Kiritsugu became in Fate Stay Night, and because Kiritsugu never was that man, Shiro never had Taiga in his life either. There's never any mention of him knowing Rin, and it seems like Julian and Sakura are his only real friends at school. He lives a life of secrecy and falsehoods, ones that never get the legitimization of things like his father-son bond with Kiritsugu, and even that relationship is much, much colder. I think this version does, on some level, still want to be a hero, but that desire is pushed back and repressed in the wake of the sheer, overpowering, frigid loneliness he lives through every day. I think it's pretty telling that Shiro even takes a page or two out of Kirei's book when he starts thinking about how he'll fight in the war. Heroism may be at the core of who Shiro is, but without that heartwarming moment of reassurance to his father from Fate Zero, it becomes hard for that fleeting dream to ever really find a place in his heart. Seeing like Shiro's largest hurdle to overcome was never loneliness, it was weakness. Both Under Snow Shiro, on the other hand, isn't weak. His powers with the Archer card, and even for a time without it, are one-to-one -one with his heroic spirit. So overcoming personal weakness doesn't work as his motivation here. This Shiro only wants one thing. To take hold of something he loves, acknowledge that it's real, and not lose it. I think it's situationally appropriate here that Oath Under Snow Shiro fills the same spot on my alignment chart as a chaotic evil character would. Whoa. That isn't to say that he's chaotic those, evil, uh, but Gilgamesh's much like a character place? with that alignment, in order to make his story believable, Wait, what, the very basics flying? of who oh, he is yeah. need to change. The core of Shiro Emiya is his unshakable desire to become his ideal, so in order for a version to exist that would openly mock that ideal for the sake of a snappy one-liner, that core needs to be shaken. In much the same way that Stana <coughs> Shiro and Kiritsugu are deconstructions of heroism, Oath Under Snow is a deconstruction of Shiro. And that fascinates me. Throughout the whole of this story, Shiro uses Archer's powers with no restraint. He looses every tool in his arsenal, every technique he's learned, every last semblance of the very same shill that formed him into who he is. Oath Under Snow Shiro is cold. He barely ever smiles in battle, and in doing so, hardly even lets himself show negative emotion, rocketed into the same emotional state as Archer in a tiny fraction of the time. Whereas Dean Shiro used Caliburn as a symbol of he and Saber's bond, Unlimited Bladework Shiro used the marble with respect and admiration, and Heaven Steel Shiro let his powers overwhelm him like a force of nature, both under Snow Shiro uses his powers less like a weapon and more like a tool. His powers don't symbolize trust in Saber, or trust in his- But I like how they show you all the different paths you can go down by just making small decisions and like different things that happen to you and stuff like that like I, I i get it you know what i'm saying i i get it you know what i'm saying you just keep the same 
keep the same characters and everything that everybody's attached to and familiar with, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, you might kill these guys off, you might kill these guys off, but at least over here, they're all right, you know what I'm saying? So it just puts a smile back on your face. But then it's like, yeah, you're experiencing, like, all these different... Yeah, I, you know... It's green, more yeah, trust I, I really in Archer. Really but rather, with. the fact that his isolation has driven him to use really him without creative, care or prejudice. Like he favors only the practical and never the sentimental. Fates like really deeming a goblet worse shit. than a mug because the latter takes up less space. I think the most important reason why Shiro from Stay Night was able to achieve his dream in the end when Kiritsugu couldn't is because his exposure to heroism started with the man who saved him gently expressing his admiration of the idea. The fact that Shiro's dream came from a place of tender family memories and years of keeping his head in the clouds hardened his resolve enough that he was eventually able to endure the hardships that came from trying to achieve his ideals. Kiritsugu was different in that his exposure to heroism was detached and emotionless, completely free of romance and warmth. He was forced time and time again to destroy the things he loved for the sake of justice, from his father to Natalia to Iris Veal and even Elia. Dang. His exposure to that dream was steeped in killing and loss, so he became unable to pursue that dream from any other lens than mindless bloodshed. Oath Under Snow Shiro is similar to Kiritsugu in that regard, and rightfully so, since the Kiritsugu who raised him was very much like the one from Fate Zero. Heroism to him was something chased with a hard stare and a heart of stone, and Shiro couldn't measure up to that. His perception of what being a hero meant drove him away from that dream until he was ready to completely abandon it for the sake of protecting his own. With a self-proclaimed heart of glass, he never could have become what his father was, and that reality leaves him on his own yet again when the last family he has left is taken and his house is suddenly empty. Shiro is not a cold person. If you watch his conversation with Sakura, it's clear that he empathizes with her and wants that emotional connection, shown on full display with how wide his eyes go when he starts to realize he's going to lose her too. This could also be taken from his interactions with Miyu, and I'd be remiss not to mention that despite trying Kirei's weapons, he ultimately decides not to continue developing that style because it doesn't suit him. Shiro is a warm person adapted to a cold world, which is a take on his character we hadn't really seen in any other Fate series before. I know I've spent more time on this individual Shiro than any of the others, but that's kind of why Oath Under Snow is in the title. Honestly, I'd have a hard time pinpointing the core of Shiro going only off the three stories in the original BN, but Oath Under Snow makes it plain as day through the simple process of deconstruction. Because this version has so much taken away from him before his call to adventure, he goes down the complete opposite path of the version of him from Unlimited Blade Works. And yet, both of these Shiros have access to their own versions. Alright, this one shows nothing but like, just like a dark reality, like, just like it was just just a whole bunch of just negative bad shit just happened to you like how would you deal with that you know what i'm saying but still try to be a good person at the same time i mean you just gotta fucking adapt to the shit that's around you you know what i'm saying you can still be you but i mean you gotta make a bet a different version of you you know what i'm saying yeah reality like, marble fuck they're the only ones who do one of them wanders forever without aim in a world of endless blades and the other seeks tiny glimmers of warmth in a frozen horizon somehow both embodying and being devoid of hope. The difference is between a man who rose from powerlessness to resolutely face solitude, and a man who crawled his way out from that oblivion so he wouldn't be alone anymore. So, why do the two Shiros with the least in common of all four both have such similar powers by the end? If you ask me, their differences might actually be the reason. I said early on in this video that friction is the main defining trait of Shiro Emiya, and in my personal belief, that friction is crucial in establishing why each one stands what they do with the reality marvel. UBW and Oath Under Snow Shiro both go through their trials and come out on the other end a changed person who's left their challenges behind. They may arrive at opposite endpoints, but they have to find who they are as well as they possibly can, and in doing so, they both gain the ability to conjure their own unique versions of Unlimited Bladeworks, distinct even from Archer's. The reason we never see Dean or Heaven Steel Shiro's versions in Marble is because they haven't gotten to that level of self-realization. You could make the argument that Fate Route Shiro's Marble would be the same as Archer's, since that's who he's most similar to, but Heaven Steel Shiro is still a mystery. Neither of those two versions reached quite so extreme an end of their adventure as the two who unlocked Unlimited Bladeworks, which is almost certainly why they didn't. I don't think I'd be able to tell you which of these versions of Shiro is my favorite. I have a deep, personal connection to Unlimited Blade Works Shiro, but Oath Under Snow is such an important puzzle piece in understanding the character on the whole, and that gives me some serious swords? bias What I will say is this. I think all four versions of Shiro are important to understand. Oh, nigga, it it's is It's difficult to over. simplify with Archer without serious? knowing the life he led before Unlimited Blade Works. UBW Shiro is arguably oh. the purest version of the character we have. <laughs> Heaven's Feel shows us Shiro dipping his toe in the water oh, when it comes to his no. ideals. And Oath Under Snow picks him apart Me, in such a thorough way giant. that it shines a light on what all three other adaptations were trying to do. To be honest, I don't think I need a favorite. Because despite their varying circumstances, I think they're all, at their core, the same person.
Oh, is that it? Oh, that was it! Hey, I ain't gonna cap, bruh. I'm not gonna cap. I'm finally, I, like, oh, first of all, I'm just glad I got to see that movie. I, nigga, I seen a whole bunch of the, all the swords, nigga, he could just, that's crack. So I know Gilgamesh is his worst if he really, like, pop, what, really wanted to pop off. That's crazy. Um, wow. Uh, W video pick, man. I ain't gonna cap. I learned a lot. There was, this video is full of info, bro. I mean, he... I, I know this video was simplified because realistically if you wanted to elaborate I'm sure this video could have been many hours <laughs> cause fate fate god damn man there's just a lot of shit anyways y'all if you like this reaction man smash the like button you know what I'm saying um, comment down below what you guys want me to react to next comment down below you guys thoughts for this video man make sure you guys share this video gang uh, check out the stream and yeah I'll see you on the next one. <laughs> shit